Hello, everyone, and welcome to This Week in Hospitality Marketing Live Show number 372. I am your host, Lauren Gray. Thank you in advance for the privilege of your time while you listen through our wonderful discourse today about something really timely. I mean, we are now sitting on September 23rd, and which means in our budget discussions, we are about to that point where we're going to be dealing with dialogue as to the validation of what we anticipate will be our budgets for 2023. That aside, from a marketing perspective, we are just now in fall. Yesterday was the first official day of fall, but you know, here in Florida, you wouldn't notice it except for it was mentioned in the news. Um, weather stays pretty much the same. It's just degrees of summer, <laughs> but all said and done, uh, we will be having a little bit of a change here next week. We do have the anticipation of a potential storm in our area or in our state, um, and that always has an interesting part of our conversation today. Our topic today is related to fourth quarter, specifically what are your plans and forecasts for 2022's fourth quarter? Um, we've kind of gone through a, kind of a short range perspective this year so far. Um, we're taking 2021 out of it. Uh, as, actually, if you look at articles and news features and so forth, and any references of numerics, it's as if 2021 didn't exist numerically. Everything is compared to 2019, which was the last kind of business benchmarking annual time, uh, which is, is not, it's not a bad thing to do. It's our only real reference point because 2020 was so artificial, 2021 was so artificial. I would say that 2022 has uh, high degrees of artificialness to it, um, at least uniqueness. I wouldn't say artificials, um, but uniqueness to it. Uh, we did see uh, similarities in our summer market compared to 2021. Um, maybe a little bit more than what we had seen historically in 2019. Although, uh, I was just reading an article from uh, Star. Uh, Star Report shows that in August 2022, as an industry overall, uh, Oxby was down 6.7% compared to 2019, same month, August 2019. Uh, but ADR was up 14%, 151.49. Oh, I'm sorry. Occupancy was listed at 65 um, Rev RevPAR also went up. So in the world of what we live in, we know that obviously if we're getting better rates um, for lesser inventory, we have the range of being able to prove revenue per available room uh, if done in enough margin. Um, then it goes through, and, and we can discuss this in our news discussion a little bit, about the the highs and the low markets in the in the U.S. and so forth, but for the most part, we we had a good summer. Um, we had a strong summer. It didn't run the way we anticipated, but we're a little bit more um, flexible to that. Uh, July fourth is what I think of when I say that. Uh, normally, July fourth was a, a, an encapsulant uh, demand period in the United States in general, um, and it turned out not to be the case. As it was, there was more ancillary business after the holiday than it was during the holiday. Now, some can say that's because of the day that the holiday landed on. It's hard to stretch a, a longer uh, vacation time around that holiday because it landed on a Monday. Um, things like that, uh, that can, can, can change the perspective of how a holiday produces, which brings us to our discussion for fourth quarter. What are your plans and forecasts for 2004, fourth quarter 2022? Um, because we've kind of been so fixated in short range, 30, 60 days or seasonal chunk summer. And that was our, our big uh, go-to period of the year that we thought, okay, if we're going to do well, it should be during the summertime. I'm not saying the spring had its downsides or something, but it was very much about an uncertainty factor. Um, we also dealt with summer being a huge wake-up call on infrastructure concerns um, with the uh, the flights and the in the... The, the stories we got from people trying to fly and the, and the the system not being able to handle the demand that it was trying to put into it and in true capitalist fashion, overselling themselves and then getting stuck with the oversell. Uh, we've done that ourselves as an industry, hospitality industry, uh, overselling our hotels and then being stuck with the fact that we have to walk. It is a strategy. Uh, it's a useful strategy to know your good margin to do that. So you always stay full when the demand is there. But it has its booby traps where sometimes you can get stuck where you're off that one, two, or dozen, and then you have to be the person that stands at the front desk and tell people that even though you did everything right, we don't have room for you. That's always a fun conversation. Um, it's the testing of the metal for all front desk people, right? With that said, we are looking at, and I'm going to be pulling up the calendar while I'm talking about this, um, 
we're talking about fourth quarter when it comes to uh, how to plan. Now, in our previous show's discussions and in our podcast, we've talked a lot about rich media, the creation of rich media, the creation of comp sets. We've talked a lot about the budget process uh, associated with um, planning and setting up for I'm sorry, my mind wandered over to what I was thinking about for the holiday. Um, and, and we've gone through all the things that we know that we should be building towards for 2023. But there is a time between us and the new 2023 budget that we've been so diligent on that we have to really make sure we optimize. And that is fourth quarter. Now, fourth quarter, as always, is known for its holiday periods, its event pivots. Uh, the first most prominent one coming up is Halloween, obviously. Uh, the second most prominent one coming up is Thanksgiving. And I'm talking about continental United States. My apologies being centric to the U.S. at this point. Now, for all my international friends, Thanksgiving isn't such a big thing, but you didn't. You have Thanksgiving for Canada in October. So each of us have our own. And then, of course, if you want to go to particular calendars, Islamic versus Hebrew, uh, you have different holiday periods that are traditional through this time of year that are large holiday festivals, uh, whether it be Hanukkah or whether it be Christmas. Um, you, you are looking at pivot points for people's decision to travel. What are you doing to make sure that you are in front of those people that are most interested in your location and product? Um, you, of course, through the budget process, have become acutely attuned to your historical data. You should be very, that should be flowing through your brain at this point as to all the data information that you've had of not just the past year or two years, but three and four years of content that you should be aware of when it comes to anticipated demands and so forth. And as much as you've been looking at 2023's fourth quarter in the sense of budget contribution, you are basing some of it on the anticipation of what 2022 was to propose itself to be. I'd like to bring in the fact that given that I'm in Florida right now, and given the fact that we have, uh, this is the first year in a while that we've had more satellites up for weather tracking and so forth, we've had more of a predictive ability for storms. I find it very unique that the unnamed storm yet that is already forecasted to come to Florida here middle of next week um, had been thought of as it was emerging from Africa. It was already being given a prediction as to its intensification potential, uh, its probability of, of, of uh, strengthening, its intended path, and also its eventual, what it's doing now, strengthening. Now, of course, there's still a, a huge amount of variabilities and so forth to it, but pretty much from a general perspective, Florida will be affected in some capacity to this. Why do I bring all this up other than the personal experience that I'm sitting here waiting for this to happen is with that predictiveness, okay, our guests are now more aware of the things that would be impacting their potential travel. Uh, California is coming up with its first heat wave, much like hurricanes, intensification scaling that they're going to identify uh, as a means of forecasting for people to understand what they should anticipate for change in weather, especially when it comes to heat. And of course, the eventual impact on power uh, rollouts and so forth, where there's grid demand for them. Um, all of these things have an impact on our ability to do our business. Now, um, I was looking at from hotelnet.org uh, uh, some recap of the conversation of the, the data conference that was in uh, um, August this past month, where people were talking, revenue managers were talking about how they were looking at um, their adaptability and their capability. Uh, in particular, I was looking at the recap that uh, was by Trevor Simpson for Hotel News Now about how revenue managers were feeling like they have weathered the worst of what COVID could represent itself as being near-death experience, literally, as quoted by um, uh, Isaac Colazzo, Vice President of Analytics for STAR, or Smith Travel Research. I think they like being called STAR, STR. So anyways, um, so they feel like things like recession, which is in our minds, as we're doing budgets for 2023 in particular, but we have the residual effects of recession right now for fourth quarter. Uh, we also have variabilities like weather. Why did I bring up the earlier context of early predictability about weather? Um, I had making the plan to go up deep farther up the coast in Florida for personal reasons. And knowing that this storm was coming and knowing the relative time frame of that storm's track and path and so forth, so far ahead, I was already influencing my choice 
as to what I was going to do, if I was going to do it, and if so, how long would I be doing it? Uh, simply because of the anticipation that this would have the possibility of affecting my travel plans. This predictive modeling that is coming into main public ver uh, venue is um, a new twist to our marketing strategies. Um, when in the, the Smith Travel Conference, the data conference, they're talking about flexibility, adaptability, revenue managers and so forth being more flexible and adaptable. Um, re re recession, upswings, downswings. We're faced with fourth quarter decisions that have a couple of new variables to it that are, are more leverageable. We have a, a midterm election. We know that that will affect people's travel anticipation because uh, for those people that are very actively engaged into their political perspectives, um, they don't want to miss if they don't already uh, early um, register or not register, but vote. Um, they're going to want to be around their home to poll, to, 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 to vote for uh, during that time. There is a political sentiment out there now that because of the um, negative perspective of mail-in voting, that people don't want to run the risk that their vote won't count so that they will probably not travel in and about um, the midterm elections. So do you have that impact on travel plans in November? Uh, also add to the fact that with recession, you have a dilution of value of dollars in comparison to actual income. So for that reason, even though gas has uh, was a, a massive drop was it 60, 60 weeks? Yeah. Um, that uh, it finally hit a goal of that 60 weeks where it was constantly down. It just finally went up a, a penny, I think. Um, then you, you have the fact that gas isn't as such a strong concern in the sense of cost of travel, like we discussed in the live shows for summertime. Uh, but it is still an impact based on the fact that food still costs more. Um, restaurants and so forth being out are costing more. Uh, accommodations, obviously, from our higher ADR and lower occupancy numbers, that was the information I just gave from uh, the Star article for August. That means people are paying more for our hotel rooms. We also are a little bit more uh, with software, SaaS software, services as, as software as a services, um, that we have more predictive modeling software. All the brands have their own version of predictive modeling where they're able to project what they think the rate should be during certain dates based on historical and potential current demand that they have for traffic. And so they're telling you that you need to hold some sort of rate far in the future where you may have been questioning what rate you should hold for then. So you have a, a lot of pressured aspects to fourth quarter that we historically don't always have in our conversations. Uh, we've had years where People were just ready to throw out the cash and have fun and buy lots of stuff, go see family, um, free and carefree. And then we have had uh, our contrast to that, which is uh, locked down tight, can't go anywhere, um, not working, concerned about future incomes and making choices from that. So we've had a lot of variations to our plans, but we have to be now in the fact that it's September 23rd. We have to see how we see the fourth quarter. Uh, what is it that we we think is going to happen based on what we are aware of as influencing our um, activities for the next 90 days until 2023, 90 days plus. Um, we do know that uh, there will be demand for travel. We do know that there are a lot of people that are looking to alter how they travel based on their concerns of uh, modalities for flights, uh, we went through a little bit of a, a short-term concern with uh, the, uh, the infrastructure of trains because of potential strike that was going to question mark whether or not passenger train services were uh, going to be permanently changed while they went through the process. Uh, and fortunately, fortunately, it was just uh, temporarily impacted. Amtrak had to cut some of its long lines down for a while. But as strange as it sounds, trains is a viable transportation consideration for some markets. Um, uh, and because of that, that impact does affect the interest in travel as to where those trains bring people. Uh, flights is another thing. You might not be thinking about taking such a long flight uh, or extending your time that you're able to travel so that you can take a different means of transportation to get to somebody that you normally would fly for. Um, it's already been told that uh, air flight costs are, uh, are much higher than they have been done historically 
That has been a persistent message since the beginning of summer that uh, there has been the travel advisories that if you're going to make plans for holidays for travel, buy them early uh, before the variations in prices go up. And that seems to be holding true for the moment. Um, these are the things that do create the influences for a fourth quarter. So I've painted the pictures of gloom and doom and pieces to the puzzle and things that are there. What are you doing about it? And this goes back to my earliest conversation about uh, your marketing strategy. Uh, because the one benefit, well, one of the benefits from going through a budgeting process is that you become acutely tuned to the data that influences your decisions. You are and have been reviewing historical data uh, over hopefully many years, not just last year. And because of that, you are aware of the ebb and flow of demand. You're aware of the ebb and flow of revenue yield. You're in the ebb and flow of, of the sources of business. Uh, and you should be acutely aware of the cost of business, uh, what it's been taking for you to operate the business. Um, and so for those reasons, you should be feeling pretty comfortable that um, you're up to your, your fighting weight, so to speak, when it comes to planning and coordinating fourth quarter. Yes. The negative is because you've been so fixated with budgets and the time consumption for it, plus the operation with the shortening of staff that we usually most everyone has, you've been overworking. And because of that, you've been focused on budgets and focused on daily operations. Your view forward is a shortened view. It's about what's happened in the next two weeks, four weeks, six weeks. After that, it gets into much like hurricane forecasting. It's kind of this way, but we're not sure yet. Um, so now is the time that as you wrap up your aggregation of budgeting processes, and now it's up to the, the people that write checks and to decide finances, uh, what you propose is being legitimate and, and adopted or whether there's still questions and follow-ups. But now you have to have things planned for. For instance, we always make fun of retail that we see Halloween candy in August. Well, have you already had your Halloween campaigns built? It's end of September. Halloween is quite literally a month away, four weeks away, 30 some odd days away. Uh, and so because of that, are you already advertising what you feel is featureability of your product around a holiday period? Whether you're doing something special for Halloween or not, it is a trigger, a catalyst for travel. Um, and if there is business to be found in your market, which I'm thinking historically, especially and I'm saying specifically the, the U.S. Uh, and, and Canada, um, then find an opportunity to have some dialogue about this. And as we've talked about historically, your first point of contact and uh, discussion is social. Um, are, have you already been this month talking about the change in season, what to do in the season, what things are to be expected and, and the things that, that they should be looked forward to in your market? For season uh, and Halloween is the first and best strongest representation of season. You can say Oktoberfest is, which is happening right about now, um, but it has a different demographic. I mean that that you're not talking about children at that point. You're talking about for those that are drinking age and want to do something that's related to it. Um, but you should have this as part of your social content, that discovery process that people have about what they're thinking about doing come the time that they're going to do it. In this case, Halloween. Um, it doesn't mean you have to go all decked out that you're trying to push and present yourself as being the Halloween center. Um, but if you're doing things for the Halloween, those are the great augmentations to your story. If you have uh, things around you that are happening in Hall for Halloween, then you should make sure that people are aware of that in your social content, uh, that those things are nearby or in proximity or that you're supporting or that those are things that people, if they're interested in, you provide information for them to go look and see what those things are. Better yet, if you have the actual resource of having your own website, having that content on there only adds to the traffic to your site and uh, adds to the authentication of your hotel in relationship to those things. Um, when it comes to, to Halloween and social and, and, and all of the content with these types of, 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 of holiday events, you have to decide, and we've had this conversation before, of the voice that you're doing this. Are you doing this to be informational, uh, third party? You know, are you looking at first person as in if you're personally trying to, to engage as an entity with people saying we feel and this is us and this is what we love to is our first person context to this? You, this is the time for you to decide what tone you want to have in discussions with the people that engage with you socially. Now, 
a lot of people feed back and say, well, I have a hotel social page and same Facebook, which is the first place to start since it's the kind of the benchmark social platform. But I don't have a lot of followers and those that do follow me don't really engage. You're right. For a variety of reasons, you're right. The idea of this is, is that the context gets posted, as they say in the internet, once on the internet. If it's there, it's there to be referred to in later tense. And if people do discover you as they begin to get more heightened interest into your market, they can go backwards to what you've been posting and sharing and get kind of up to speed as to the things that you've been trying to share about. So having it there is a value, not just in its immediate inter interaction, but it's in residual uh, value as well. For branded hotels, that's a very strong point uh, to have because you don't have a lot of latitude of where you can post about what you're doing on other mediums. Your brand website doesn't have that flexibility. Um, you don't really have other venues of discussions and opportunities to share this for, except for social platforms, which allow you the lateral ability to add content about yourself or your perspectives of things or the events that are happening around your, your business uh, for people to discover. And there's a whole strategy we've discussed about that process with social. The other is to determine what you're going to spend advertisement on. Um, blanket shotgun advertisement is terrible. We've, did, we've torn that apart several times in discussion. It's about targeting what people are most engaged with. So picture this in process. If you, right now, September 23rd, decide to start putting content about what's happening around Halloween in, in relationship to your hotel, the fact that you're nearby uh, a corn maze or you're right next to some really neat uh, trick-or-treat area or that a lot of restaurants in your area are doing a lot of Halloween stuff over the course of the weekend, um, then at that point, you can put that in social now. Right now, as of today, start pl plugging those things. You're faced with three choices with social when it comes to this. Obviously, you can put a text statement up. That is your least engagement. Then you have your image uh, that you can put up, and that will have a better than your text engagement. But the real engagement is video. Video or animation of sorts that uh, can tell a, a lot more data and content because of the visualization than how much you can type. People aren't going to read three paragraphs of what you think is interesting. They're going to look at the video and see what they find interesting. And then if they want to, they'll read uh, the accessory content that you have associated with the video. Um, the idea that uh, you put this content on social is to begin to feed people the idea that if they're choosing travel and you're a possible destination, the value proposition that you represent in that destination for what you're willing to share. Again, brand hotels, this is your venue of opportunity to expand your content. Uh, there's lots of messages that can go along with this. I, I pause for a moment because I wanted to remind everyone, I found it very interesting that music festivals, festivals in general, uh, concerts, pretty much the things that brought a lot of people to a small area are back in force. Uh, a lot of, it isn't just the old ones coming back. Some of them aren't. They just didn't survive the interest level lost from COVID in the pandemic timeframe. And I'm not saying we're out of the pandemic at this point. I'm just saying that in comparison to the extremes that we have gone through these past couple of years. Um, and then there's a lot of surgence of new things that are coming along uh, that restaurants are spreading their, their, their wings about bringing in a lot more people because they bring in a higher caliber band or they have access to an area that they can run a major a minor concert to remember one of the influences from the pandemic was outdoor seating i can say here in florida a lot of restaurants that had maybe a few chairs outside mainly for waiting or something have really gone in and invested in building outside decks covered and what have you um for the potential, uh, adaptive potential, that if they ever needed to rely on the outdoor seating as their seating for anything that comes along like the pandemic, uh, that they have that option. They also are showing an indoor-outdoor. They're expanding their seating capability. A lot of, of uh, legal restrictions as to the usability of common space in front of businesses had been uh, reduced over the pandemic. And a lot of uh, restaurants are taking advantage of that. Hotels have the opportunity to reevaluate their outside common space that was kind of like a secondary, well, there's an extra deck area by the pool. You know, it's a space that we have to, we have stoned over. Um, now it's like, well, maybe if we put something out there. 
so there's a whole redefinition of usable space that is there. So this idea of, of these small events and these concerts and what have you that may not have existed before, maybe a lot of people aren't even aware that this is a burgeoning thing in your market. This is a chance for you to share with that on social. It goes to our discussions of the content that you're putting on social, whether it be images or whether it be video and what have you. And we've we've been beating and grinding that axe about uh, getting your video up and doing it affordably. We've we've talked a lot about providing this medium of opportunity for you, and it means also using other channels that you weren't adding into your marketing strategy, like YouTube, uh, YouTube advertisement. Uh, it is amazing that it is the second largest search engine only to Google itself, which is own, you know, Google and YouTube are the same place. Um, and if you have used YouTube, which most people do, uh, for a lot of search abilities, I mean, uh, nowadays, we, well, I'll look on YouTube to see if there's a video about somebody either showing me how to do this or showing me information about this or what have you. Putting videos up that offer content is a, is a very viable search pro thing. So I can go to a search engine, Google, okay, and I go and look for something and I get results. And there are usually links. And then you see that that Google has added videos in there. And if I'm learning it to do a how-to, I want the videos. That's what I'm actually looking for. I've come to be a little bit more about just going to YouTube and typing in if I'm looking for something. Um, obviously, travel destinations is a very visual thing as well. Uh, they can go to our website. And, and this is where we've kind of hurt ourselves and most people places have, but hospitality in particular has, is that we're so focused on shotgunning data on our websites that it becomes cumbersome to somebody that doesn't know what exactly they're looking for or they're looking for a particular thing because of something we've put out there. But coming to our website, they have to reset and start all over again to look for what it is that they're interested in. They have to figure out our navigation. So where are their events on this navigation? Uh, more information, local information, whatever we label it or cutesy naming, naming it or something. Then they have to find that and then we have to see if it's relevant. And usually it then ties together to links that we have of other content. YouTube makes it a little easier. All we're looking at a lot of times in the search process is validation. Um, I'm interested in this thing. Okay, let me go look at this thing in video to see if it's something that I look like. If there's a video about your hotel, I can quickly tell whether it's a hotel I like to stay at. If if you have videos about things that, that are close by to you, I'm like, oh, that sounds like a lot of fun and it's right next door. Then I can go look at a map and see, yeah, they're right. It's right around the corner or, you know, it's, that's five minutes away. Or boy, they say it's right around the corner, but it's 15 minutes away. That doesn't seem like it's really close. Whatever it is, visual helps. What are you doing right now for your first hump of, of discovery interest, which is the, the uh, holiday season and Halloween being the first piece to that? And that's where you have to have your ongoing current program. This gets muddled between a few things, revenue management and their strategy of yield, sales and their comparison to what they can sell versus what's taken away from them to sell because transient replaces them. Operations as to their cost effectiveness. Obviously, they like higher ADR and uh, that reduces their, their uh, strain on their, their hard costs with things. Um, and then you have marketers who are looking for opportunities, but then they don't offer anything unique to offer except for the awareness that there's things available in market, like they're not offering a special deal or a rate or what have you. So they have to be collaborative. They have to, you have to look at and say, okay, what's our real opportunities? Now we've talked about some of the processes of this, but just to kind of step through some of these very quickly is Identify who it is you're trying to chase down. Okay, so what persona a person is looking to stay with you for the holiday period, Halloween in particular first? Okay, where did they come from? What, what, uh, how did they get to you? Did they drive? Did they fly? Uh, did they come as a family? Did they come as a couple? Did they come independently? Uh, did they come as a group? You know, friends getting together? Is there smurf relationships with sales for that? Um, what's the, what, is the, uh, what is the persona of the people that um, take advantage of coming to your hotel during Halloween? What is the average length of stay? Historically, when did they first start looking for you, which is earlier than what we're talking right now, but let's just say that you're looking at it. Um, when do they tend to book? What is the average rate that they tend to go for? Where, where we see that they get the most bookings from what rate? And so what rate resistance are there? These are questions that you just bring up to begin to create some sort of globulous perspective as to what you're looking to achieve for Halloween. Then you go and look at what can I do to get in front of them? 
what are the channels that they use? Do they use, uh, you know, the ad campaigns we've done better? Do they go to our website more? Do they engage with social more? Do they relate more to our CRM engagements when we offer emails, offering unique deals or awarenesses or local information through the CRM? How do we dialogue with this, this persona that we identified for Halloween's holiday period? And this is the process that you need to do, should have done, but now today is better than, let's say, what's the best, uh, the second best day to, um, to plant a tree, you know, 20 years ago and today. So the idea is that even if you haven't done it a month ago, you should be doing it today. At least get caught up as fast as you can to as far as you can with this type of program and then be ahead of yourself for Thanksgiving, be ahead of yourself for Christmas. Um, Because really right now, you should be thinking about what you're going to be doing for the Thanksgiving November cycle. Uh, And and what can you do to fill and help the first half of the month as well? Um, Sorry, I'm thinking about contrast. I have two clients. One has a very busy early month. And very quiet holiday period. The other one is just the complete inverse. Very busy holiday period, almost non-existent business for the first half. And it's geographic demand. It's what people are interested to come to their market for that dictates that kind of uh, activity. So right now, that's the first things you start doing. Then once you've identified the channels and, and you've gone through the demographics, you now have the channels. Now it's the type of messaging in those channels. Okay, so if they respond to ads, the ads have to feature something that we're offering related to the hotels, whether it's proximity to an event and or our special features and or our special prices. That gets defined. So that's the message that gets defined. So now we have the people, the channel, the message. Now we have to create the modality. How do we want to get this in front of them? And usually it's from the channel perspective of, okay, if they're using social, the platforms are usually Facebook's included in this discussion. So our best bet is one, to put content about this organically. So it's there. Hopefully have it correlate to content that we have on our website, which is there. But from a paid perspective, we want the ads to bring the audience that sees our ads and engages our ads to the content that we want them to see that's in more in depth than what the ad provides. As we talk about insistently, that ads are a trigger. They're a call to action. They're not there to explain the entire offer in the brief period of attention that you have from the people looking at them. They're to inspire the, that sounds interesting enough for me to act, click the button. And from there, they go to a place that has more in-depth content that they can make a more evaluative approach to whether they want to continue the engagement with you or find that it's just not quite what they're interested in. The ad can't solve the world's answers when it comes to what you're offering. Now, that being said, there's always exceptions to every rule. There are abilities to go over and create an ad that goes directly to a book engine because it is very clear. 50% off your book now, click. Not a lot of explanation that has to go on with that, okay? And if you slap Halloween weekend on top of that, then you're pretty much clear to say it's going to go to the book engine for people to see what the offer means financially. Obviously, if they're unaware of your product, obviously, if they're not aware of the value of where you are in relation to what they're interested in, they could do that once they go to the book engine and realize this is a great price. Let me see if I want to know more about the hotel, reviews, images, what have you. This is where the richer the media, the better the message. If you can have still or animation images, GIF images that can visually represent what you're offering or talking about or do a video that brings you to the message point very quickly because of the, of the video's content, then that is much more beneficial than the open-ended interpretation that I hope it's what I want, let's see if it's worth it, which is a driver to hit a button, but also is a quick way of abandonment afterwards. These strategies are, you know, whether we talk about the Halloween or Thanksgiving or Hanukkah or whatever, are modalities of timeframes. Right now we're talking about placing organic content in of the things that you've identified that are interested, uh, that historically have been interested for the field that you're time zone, uh, the time area that you're looking at, identifying who those messages should be for, catering to placing those messages on the channels that they're most engaging with you for, offering what it is that they're most likely to be interested in spending money for at a time that they're most interested in looking to make a decision or awareness to make those decisions. That's the process. With it being September 23rd, you should be all in and leaned in to October's marketing right now because lead time generates this. And from a revenue manager's perspective, it used to be when they operated in their own that they were very aware of what was called prime booking window. Then there was booking date. Then there was the, the arrival date, duration time, and departure date. So those were fixed entities within their structure of data. 
marketers introduced the fact that there is much more in front of that. There's the discovery portion of a, of finding out that you exist or finding an interest in you, going to an education phase, which is then evaluating what exactly you'd be interested in doing and where and how and whether you're a part of that equation, which then goes into the process that's closer to the revenue managers, which is the acquisition point, which is Zemot, which is then going through the, I've made my decisions and choices down to a point. I make some comparisons. I might do some ancillary research, again, slightly educational, but I'm here to make a decision, a purchase decision. That's when it gets into the stronger realm of revenue management. Because we've had what we've done in these past few years, that revenue management isolation perspective compared to markets isolation perspective, silos, is almost gone. It's still around, but it's almost gone that because of our, our ability to have culled down our costs, and sometimes we had to cull down our staff uh, through what we've gone through in the past couple of years, uh, that one person that was revenue manager might have now become man marketing or vice versa. And they now understand both sides of that discussion, um, that, that unification of data is being valuable. So bringing all this up uh, for fourth quarter, we have the opportunity in spite of the negative numbers of recession, in spite of the negative numbers of travel, of travel woes and problems and what have you, um, everybody still wants to go to grandma's house. Everybody still wants to see family. And if anything, that residual need is still strong from what we've gone through through the pandemic. Uh, for the tragedy of those that have lost people in their lives, the reaffirmation of family and the value of family is even higher, which it should be. Uh, for those that have weathered the storm of pandemic and have restricted what they've done historically, um, the desire to go back to being able to feel comfortable going to see family or going to events or going to concerts or going and enjoying the holiday around people is uh, a stronger than normal historical demand. Um, the strong workforce means that people aren't looking at a dead-end income in the sense that they they don't have any monies coming in, so they have a duration of what monies they have. Um, there is still the fact that people are able to find good jobs. Uh, obviously, we know that the wages aren't matching the inflation uh, when it comes to the um, cost of things. So there is a dampener on people's budget size. Uh, if you remember over our Sunday, our Sunday, over our summer conversations, we said that statistically, uh, people take two trips, two vacations a year. Um, one is substantive in length, usually associated with summertime or spring. And the other is usually holiday based. Well, that's the other one we're talking about now for fourth quarter. We're talking about Halloween. We're talking about Thanksgiving. We're talking about Christmas, New Year's, Hanukkah, um, lots of variations to different things um, that happen in the fourth quarter. This is the second vacation period. Now, it doesn't usually mean a longer duration, but there is a conversation going that there is probably an influence on extending uh, the holiday travel because of the um, effort to travel, the, the challenges and woes of flight or the distances of driving or whatever have you, that if you're going to go someplace, you're going to make it worthwhile and you'll add that extra day or two to it. We also know that from a change in the pandemic as a society that we have a lot more of people have a flexible means of work uh, for those that can work from home or can work remotely or have that option or have some flexibility as to their demand of the time that they have to come into their work environment, then that means that people can, quote, have a, a workation uh, where they go and see uh, friends and family over the holidays. And that, that time they would normally have to get back to get to the office can actually be, you know, going into another room and opening the laptop and putting something behind you and blurring it. Um, and being on a call or communicating or working for the few hours that you need to that day. So it'd be a work day. Um, these are all influences to what's happening in our market. These are the things that you need to look at talking and seeing historical data and talking and seeing uh, current data, asking guests. Uh, we've not mentioned this in a while, but it's a great thing to remind everyone of is surveys are awesome. Um, People know that their information is worth something. So I would say that if you ever do offer a survey, there's a caveat of reward for somebody providing information. It also means that, uh, that people tend to be a little bit more prolific in their answers. 
if they feel like there is a carrot at the end of the stick that validates their extra efforts. If you're just asking out of the kindness of their heart to give a feedback, you'll get abbreviated, generalized, mean kind of stuff where they're not going to think about it too hard to say really bad and they're not going to think about it too hard to say really good. They'll be like, yeah, everything seems okay. Or, oh, this is, you know, I think this is fine. What you're doing is great because they're just getting through it saying, well, I'll answer the questions for them, but I'm really not going to spend the world of time on it. But if you offer them a decent reward for doing it, then be like, well, you know what? They are going to give me that. I know it's not a lot, but you know what? I'm going to make sure that I answer a couple of more comments to this or something, which is really the valuable part of getting a survey. Asking people what they're looking forward to do in the holidays, even if it's talking across the front desk as you're checking in or checking out people, talking to them in the food outlets. Uh, what, what are your plans for the holidays? What, what you, you, know, you, know, you have some corporate travel right now. I mean, it's not back to where it was prior to the pandemic, but it is there. You have groups that are coming in. You have social events. You have smurf businesses coming. There's a lot of people there for different reasons that you can really solicit a conversation with. It's like, so are you thinking about coming back to the area for the holidays? Yeah, yeah, we have family here. That's what we're here for X, Y, Z. Oh, wow. Are you thinking about coming back? Wow. Um, plan on staying longer? You know, this goes to educating your team to know why this information is important. If you leave housekeeping to just do housekeeping, you leave engineering just to do engineering. If you leave your uh, outlet operators, your restaurant managers and, and, and floor staff to just doing their jobs. One, they have no incentive to ask these questions. Two, they don't know why they would even ask them because they don't understand the context of what the data would be useful for. So they're not gonna remember the right things anyway. This is where keeping your teams informed as to what you're trying to do, what you hope to accomplish by what you're doing and how they're a critical part of that success because everybody lives and breathes as a single entity when people are, are staying at our resorts or hotels. So this ability of communicating with your staff is really critical to get the information from their engagement with your current guests that will help you define your target markets for persona, your target markets for people as to what their anticipation is unique to your hotel, unique to your destination, unique to your current clients. And I'm not saying the same people are gonna be coming back, but a lot of times they can be indicative of people that are considering coming to your market because they're thinking about another place, another travel experience in the same light. This information is not official. It's not massive uh, numbers and huge data sets and confidence factors and all this other stuff. It's a gut check as to the information related to your guests. What are people's plans for Thanksgiving? What are the people's plans for Christmas? Uh, if you hear a lot of, I don't have the money or this was it, I had to go to this wedding, but I don't have anything to, I don't have enough money to do anything. Or I'm going to be, I used up all my vacation days and now it's just, I got to work through the holidays or some are picking up secondary jobs during the holidays saying, I'll be working extra because I, I just, this is my chance to make some, some extra money beyond what my current job allows me to do because it's holiday money or whatever. There's a lot of variations to these questions, a lot of variations to people's decision models. Um, uh, I can honestly say, given like what I'm dealing with next week for hurricanes, um, you always think that you're unique in your perspective. Like, oh, I'm going to go to that store before anybody else gets crazy and goes get water. And you show up at the store and there's a line out the door because everybody else had the same crazy thought that let's go get water now. You're as unique as you'd like to think. You are very similar to so many people. That logic is what I'm talking about in talking to your current guests, not whether me as the guest you're talking to is personally thinking about coming back for something, which is possible, but not probable. Okay. It's the, the perspective of how I perceive what my plans are. And is that applicable to thinking that how I say what I'm going to do, even if it's not me doing it here, that other people would be also thinking the same, but would be making that hotel the destination of interest for them. Those types of decision perspectives come from a collective team effort. What you need to show the team is that you're not waiting for the answers. You have plans for what the answers mean. I often tell you before you start a quiz, figure out what you would do if you got the answer. It's strange to say, but the best quizzes and the best surveys come from what would I do with this information if I got it? Well, I'd be able to do this. And sometimes you dead end yourself. It's like, well, that'd be really curious to know, but it's really not helpful in an actionable way. Um, that fact that they like our, our, our tan walls, nice to know, not functionally useful for what I needed the data for. So asking what you would do with the answer before asking the question dictates what questions you ask. And 
getting your team informed as you should be doing each day with what the daily routines are. Like I used to, again, I've talked about this many, many times. We used to call them NETMAs. Nobody ever tells me anything. Meetings happened first thing in the morning. Representatives of the departments were together. It was a quick recap of arrivals, departures, events, activities, down issues, up issues, transitional issues, function issues, and whatever it is, everyone was aware of what was going on in the hotel that day. This is where you introduce these types of things. We say, guys, we want to get a sense of what people are traveling for, what their travel plans are for the holidays. If you get to engage with a guest, whether it be front desk, hallway, restaurant, whatever, uh, in the dialogue, say, hey, you know, um, what's your holiday plans? Are you looking forward to travel? Whatever it is, whatever way personally they adapt the conversation question to their personality, ask them. And just gather the information up and then on the next NETMA, let it come back. And say, well, when we were talking to people yesterday, there was a lot of people who said they're not really planning on traveling for Thanksgiving. Oh, did they see where they're coming from or anything? And this refines the process. So people begin to understand like, oh, man, if I just asked them where they were from, maybe that has an effect. Like they were from Alaska. Yeah, they're not going to come back down here or travel. They're going to be up there for that. Whatever it is, quantifying the questions with the answers that you get means that you can better determine what data you have to make these decisions. All of this should be an ongoing process. Uh, this shouldn't be an awareness as of September 23rd today that you need to be doing these things. Um, some historical things for fourth quarter. Uh, having had hotels for many, many years in the South on the non-snow regions, we always had our winter cold campaigns in the breach, meaning ready to go. We knew what we wanted to say. We know what the images were. We all agreed on the copy, the content, the campaigns everything and they were all set to trigger when the cold weather happened and stayed not just there was a cold dip and it came back up or anything like this but when the cold weather hit the north and they went into the winter cycle it, it got cold and it stayed cold that's when you saw uh the advertisements of warm sunny beaches and happy to have you down in the warm weather and so forth started and they got heavier as the weather was more inclement when the wet, when the blizzards started coming through and the nor'easters and everything else, the more the advertisement rank, cranked up about, shouldn't you think about getting into the warm weather right now? Take a break from the winter and get to the warm. All that kind of stuff. That kind of pre-planned strategy is what you need to be considering for your fourth quarter. But with a lot more adaptability, you need to look at the fact that there are other influencing factors beyond weather that can trigger people's travel demands. Some might be that you've been busy all out. Can't you know? Nobody could ever get a room at your hotel because you're just in such high demand. But during the fourth quarter, you're not as much. Maybe people are looking for the peace and quiet that that represents compared to the hecticness of what was before. Maybe people are just looking for a change of venue. Maybe transitionally, people are migrating from one area to another because of the changes in weather. As we have down in Florida, snowbirds. There is a lot of other migrations of people. Just ask the people in the Southwest. You have the same southerly migration from cold north weather that drives people into the southern regions that don't have the cold weather. By the same token, you have a lot of people that are in the perpetually warm south, such as me in Florida, where going north in the wintertime is a wonderful idea of transition and change because I don't have to live in it for any length of time. So I don't have to suffer with the ramifications of what cold, persistent cold weather might mean. I get to enjoy the the snow and, and and what have you. I go skiing or something. Uh, don't go skiing. Um, but to enjoy the winter. Um, also, there's people that make it a transitional flip-flop where they actually enjoy the winter for a longer period of time. They'll get an Airbnb, perhaps, uh, or VRBO and spend a few weeks uh, in the mountains when they live on the beach normally or in the, in the, in the, in the tropics. Uh, so there's lots of reasons for people to shift and migrate depending upon things. Ironically, and, and I think this still holds true, the largest snow ski club is in Florida and the largest diving club, scuba diving club is in Colorado. It goes to the idea that, um, up, you know, what you don't have is what you want most kind of thing. Um, these are the things that need to be considered for fourth quarter, but out of it, you have to adapt what you're doing to the current interest trends. Uh, let me bring up just a quick thing before we drop into some new stuff before we close out the, the hour is TikTok has turned into a very dominant source of social media dialogue. Uh, it, it goes completely into what we discussed about uh, video, imagery, rich media, interaction. Um, there's Because of the volume of traffic, it's actually 
turned into uh, higher than Facebook, higher than Instagram, higher than other social platforms for time on the platform. Um, Facebook is not the same as it once was. And we'll talk about that in just a minute as well. Uh, TikTok is a place where people go. They, it's editable. Swipe, watch, swipe, watch, swipe, watch. They also say that a lot of people go there for news. And demographics dependent upon this as to who and where and what gets used for it and so forth. But uh, uh, 20%, a fit, one out of five news things or things that are informing of you something are flat out wrong. There's no validation verification source on this. And as we've seen in our society now, uh, the idea that if you say it enough times, it must be true is not truth. It's just demanded f fixations. So just because it's on a platform like TikTok and people see it, this oh well, that that well, I didn't know that it did that. You know, they show these miracle ways of cleaning the stains off of a carpet or something. Oh, that must be true. And then you ruin your carpet because you try it. Then there's also things on there challenges where uh, boiling chicken and night or something, just stupid stuff that it just shows you how gullible people are to follow these things. Well, the platform is still there. I'm not condoning that hotels go into TikTok if they're not doing so much of other things that they should be doing already. But if you have the demographic requirement and you have the messaging capability, it's not something to ignore either. So that kind of perspective as to where do you engage with people, that channel designation as to what people are using to engage with you and become informed about you, is, the, is one of the lead grounds for what you need to for your fourth quarter discussions. So that kind of goes, we ambled over around different places of different things to it and all, but the idea is there that this is a unique time of year where we have featureability of events, holidays in particular, that we can really hang our hat on on saying whether we want to create initiatives for. We need to be mindful of the channels that those initiatives need to be on and the messaging that is on those channels corresponding to the channel quality of what it is. And then, of course, the demographics that we're speaking to, all the information, whether we're talking to a particular geography, demography, behavioral, what have you. And um, that's where persona building comes up. So a couple of news items. I want to bring one up, and I'm bringing it up in the podcast as well. Uh, so Meta is um, getting sued for tracking iOS users, even if they've opted out. For those familiar from a technological side, um, iOS 14, when, just to give you a sense, we're on iOS 15 for Apple now. Or 16, excuse me, uh, had the security permissions rolled into it that said basically any platform operating through Apple's iOS platform, you know, apps that uh, were to track any data and information had to ask for permission of the user that that data and information could be tracked. Well, initially, and Facebook fought this tooth and nail. Um, then we can say, well, you know, iOS phone users only represent 11% of all users. It's not going to have a big deal on our ability to track because it's such a small portion of our overall audience. Mm, wasn't true. Actually, even though 11% of the people numerically have iPhones, they represented over 50% of the actual traffic associated with Facebook. So what did that mean? Well, the first quarter of this year, Facebook for the first time in its history, did not grow in the sense of users. It reclined, it declined, it went less than. And in the second quarter, it announced for the first time either a, a loss of revenue or in the sense that it didn't constantly grow its revenue. It didn't go negative, it just didn't go year over year, month over month, quarter over quarter growth. Because it affected the ability of them to track users when they left Facebook as to what they did, where they went, third-party tracking codes, okay? Uh, and so it hurt their advertisers because they couldn't target the people more effectively following them with cookies. Like, okay, we can we know that they came from this place, so we're going to offer this ad. They went to that place, so we're going to make sure they offer this ad. That data got dulled from the lack of data being offered from the iOS um, exclusions. So Meta decided, well, there's a way around this apparently. And that is, we won't let them go out of our platform. We'll let them use our browser. And on our browser, we'll still track their information. Which goes against iOS policy of saying that if you are tracking data, you have to give permission or get permission from uh, the user that you can have this data tracked and decline it if you don't. Well, that never happened according to this suit to Meta. 
that said that uh, they were doing it anyway. So we'll see where that goes. Um, also in the news was something, uh, I already mentioned the Star Report uh, as to what August was over August of 2019. Uh, higher ADR, lower occupancy. It had some high and lows as to performances. Um, no surprise that um, uh, Oahu uh, in Hawaii had the largest occupancy. Um, which was still only, it was still down compared to 2019, but only down 8.3%. It was 81.6% occupancy in Oahu. Uh, we know that pre- previous to the pandemic, Hawaii was having a real serious issue discussion uh, come to terms with over touristization. Uh, way too many people for too few resources, and there was a huge problem for it. So uh, the fact that it came back to the strongest post pandemic um, lockdown is not a real big surprise, although it's going to be a mitigation of are they going to be able to regulate this over tourism issue that they had prior to the pandemic. Um, let's see, lowest occupancy for the month included New Orleans, which was only 47.3%, Houston 55.3%. Um, New Orleans it, uh, had the steepest decline in occupancy compared to 2019 of negative 21.9. Um, again, it's talking... Not there's no really like surprise moments with the data they were sharing in their general news release to it. I'm sure there's more data about their their paid for format report, but no real huge surprises for August in comparison to that. We did have a good strong summer in general terms, um, and there was a data conference that was in uh, in Tennessee in uh, Nashville uh, that Star had originated and continues to do, and there was an interesting couple of articles that came from that about uh, resiliency and adaptability. And I want to address a couple of them uh, just in general perspective. The attitude consensus from what I'm reading from Trevor Simpson's uh, Hotel News Now article is that revenue managers are kind of beating their chest a little bit like, oh, man, we handle COVID. We can handle anything. Uh, we know what to be prepared for next time. We we have contingencies in plan now about layoffs, and we have contingency in plans about uh, yield abilities and, and knowing now. And that's all true. We do have better awareness of what we can do when these things happen compared to what we did when COVID happened. But I also have to say that uh, a lot of this bravado comes from those that survived versus those that didn't. And let me just say that in, in realistic terms, if I was a revenue manager at a uh, hotel, and we went through the pandemic when it was happening. And I watched the tremendous amount of people around me be let go furloughed because of lack of business. And that's a business decision, not condemning that. I condemn how it may have been done. Um, and I survived. I have a bit of a Teflon feel. Like, okay, if this kind of stuff happens again, I'm critical team. I'm, I'm they, they can let others go, but I'm not going to go. Because I proved my worth. I took on the marketing when they let go of the marketing person. I took on the sales because they let sales. I'm the durable one. So, yeah, there's a little bit of bravado saying, well, we know what we're doing next time. Because next time I already know I can go lean into this stuff. And they're going to keep me here as I watch those that went in and out of those positions go back out of them again. That kind of, you know, like I survived the the the, the, the bombing kind of things. Like, okay, well, I, I, I know what to expect next time. Mm-hmm. I would say that that comes from a sense that you're going to respond the same way next time. And I don't think that's always the case. Adaptability truly means complete flexibility. You base it on conditions of expectations, but at the end, your result is based upon the actual events that are causing the changes. So as much as you think because of what has happened, it'll happen that way in the response program again, doesn't necessarily, it will be that again. There was plenty of hotels that closed during the pandemic um, that did not come back. I think in Midtown hotels in particular for New York. Um, I think that there's a lot of companies that no longer exist in their full form that they were prior to the pandemic compared to if they are now. And some of them are completely gone in spite of that. There's been a lot of very large changes. The people, as they often say, the, the victor writes the history. These people going to the conferences from the perspective of survivability are there because the people that didn't survive it in their context aren't there to tell their story about what they learned or didn't learn from this. I think there are some residual things associated with um, the pandemic's influence on our business in the sense that people are less trusting of a company to say that we're a family-oriented, dedicated-to-you company 
when the company historically has not performed that way. Um, there is more of a uh, self-centric self-preservation that, yeah, they'll change jobs, but their loyalty to the job is only in the benefit of what they're getting from it rather than to their, their desire to be a good contributor to a, you know, a large cause. I think there is a negative impact to a lot of these things too. So as fast as we are to drop people, the fastest is for them to also not to stay with us and find something better. Their their durability has diminished, I think, as well. So that's my little essay on perspective for the show. So there you have it. We're at our hour and then some. Um, I thank you for the privilege of your time. Um, for everyone watching us live on the social media platforms, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, so forth, we'll recast this show for our APAC friends, uh, 11.30 a.m. Wednesday morning, Sydney time, 11.30 a.m. Uh, Wednesday morning, London UK uh, time for our U EU friends. Um, you can always find us on the free side of our TV channel, the hospitality channel. Just look forward to it on Roku, uh, Google TV, Apple TV, Amazon TV. Just look for hospitality channel. We're also on your uh, phones and uh, tablets as an Apple iOS and or Google Play. Just look for the hospitality channel there and you can watch the shows there. Plus there's a paid platform behind it. Also let everyone know we are on beta launch for our hospitality marketing club. This is an advanced journeyman and advanced level club. For right now, we're not charging to participate. We're rather gathering our community, fine tuning what it is the community is gonna be involved with. We're gonna be doing weekly questions and answers for advanced dialogue. This is not for somebody that wants to learn about PCBC or learn about social advertisement. There are plenty of platforms that teach basic stuff. This is about people that are already doing it. This is about people that need to ask peer level questions about how does this compare to this, or I'm stuck here doing this. And it's an open dialogue. Um, and right now, as I said, it's not a paid for club. It's about a qualifying club. There's a little 10 questions you have to answer. If you don't get 90%, nine out of 10 right, uh, we'll let you know that we'll let you try again. But the reality of it is, is that if you can't qualify to join the club, we can't have any club because the last thing you want to do is feel like you're enjoying an advanced conversation and people are asking questions that are not advanced. We're not trying to be prestigious about this. We're trying to be functional. Uh, I found that there was no place uh, that was making it available for advanced dialogue when it comes to marketing for hospitality. That is the niche of this club, Hospitality Marketing Club. It's about marketing for hospitality. It's about people that are already doing it. It's about people wanting to meet other people that are connected to it. It is very much like a social platform, but it also is a engagement pl platform. There are people that offer services in there if you want to, um, but will be helpful all the same. And it'll eventually tier up where people have more and more advanced dialogues and those tiers of engagement will continue to, to rise. So that's the idea and the premise. And we hope that uh, it's of interest to you. You can join us. You can simply go to hospitalitymarketing.club. There's a sign on form. I'll send you the quiz. Um, and we'll go from there. And like I said, we're not charging for it now and don't know exactly when we'll start charging for it, when it feels right, I guess. But here's your chance to join it and get a part of it and get to dialoguing with people that are of the same combination of interest and skill. So once again, my name is Lauren Gray. Again, thank you for the privilege of your time and I look forward to talking to you all next week. <laughs>